everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today for the ninth episode of NEMA Voices, a virtual interview series. My name is Lisa Doy. I am a curatorial assistant at JANUM working on the uh, new uh, permanent exhibit. Um, and I'm also um, a PhD student in American Studies at Indiana University, one of the staff members of TV for Solidarity and the president of JACL Chicago. So I get to experience a wide range of um, aspects and organizations of the Japanese American community in the United States. Um, and I'm really lucky to get to spend this evening um, uh, with Greg Robinson, um, who's our speaker tonight. Um, but before we get to hear from Greg Robinson, I wanted to talk a little bit more about Discover Nikkei and the NEMA Voices series. Discover Nikkei is the Japanese American National Museum's international community-based web project with major funding from the Nippon Foundation. It was launched in 2005. The site is featured in four languages, English, Japanese, Spanish, and Portuguese, and shares unique Nikkei stories from around the world, throughout the United States, Brazil, Japan, Peru, Canada, Argentina, Mexico, and other countries. New stories are published daily on the website. NEMA are members of the Discover Nikkei community hailing from all over the world. They each bring unique experiences and perspectives to the site's rich archive of stories. NEMA Voices is an interview series where we uplift our NEMA through brief but enlightening interviews. In this ninth episode, I get to speak with Greg Robinson, a noted author and scholar of the Japanese American and Japanese Canadian history. He teaches at the University of Quebec at Montreal. Greg has been contributing articles to Discover Nikkei since 2009, shedding light on extraordinary yet little known Nikkei, many of which were published in an award-winning anthology, The Unsung Great, Portraits of Extraordinary Japanese Americans. We'll be chatting about some of his favorite stories from the book, his connections to Discover Nikkei, and more. After I talk with Greg, um, I'll ask him some of your questions from the YouTube or Facebook chat feature. Um, so please put your questions in the chat and we'll get to them at the end of the conversation. You will need to be logged in to use the chat feature. We'll also be sharing links to the articles we mentioned in the chat and in the video description afterwards. So I guess I'll just start um, with maybe learning a little bit more about you. In an article published on Discover Nikkei, you wrote about how assisting your mother led you to become a scholar of Japanese American and Japanese Canadian history, despite not being Nikkei yourself. Can you tell us a little bit more about how this happened? Yes, well, I had been in graduate school writing a dissertation on something else. And then I took time off to work with my mother because my mother, who was an attorney and who had at one time been uh, a civil rights activist. In fact, she had worked for an encyclopedia about which she had written, been assigned to write about uh, concentration camps. And she had been uh, involved in putting a section on Japanese Americans in her draft article on concentration camps for which she was roundly criticized by her superiors. But she became eventually an attorney and because she was ill, she needed somebody who could literally uh, pick and fetch things for her. I thought that if she stopped working, she would lose the will to live. And so I agreed to give up my graduate school career and go work for her. But then once I was working for her, I was introduced to all sorts of legal concepts that were very interesting in extending my knowledge of history, uh, knowledge of how to interview clients, knowledge of how to do research, uh, understanding about rules of evidence, like we're hearing now with the uh, January 6th committee and the question of what is hearsay. Uh, that was, I had a thorough education in that working for my mother. And then I was commissioned to, to write an article on Franklin Roosevelt. And I remember that when I'd been at the Roosevelt Library, I had seen uh, a finding aid for writings by Roosevelt. And so I thought, well, why don't I write about his writings from before he was president? And I ordered up these uh, articles, and I discovered that there were articles about diplomatic relations between the United States and Japan, which he wanted to improve in the 1920s. He thought that the Japanese could be trusted and that the U.S. and Japan could settle their differences. But he said that the big obstacle was the treatment of Japanese immigrants. 
that they came over and made trouble and they couldn't become Americans. And so he said that the restrictions on entry of Japanese and other Asian immigrants and the laws against them in West Coast states that prevented them from owning property or becoming citizens were all good things because they protected the racial purity of white Americans against intermarriage. And that so shocked me hearing Roosevelt talk like a, a racist that I wondered if that's what he thought in the 1920s, what did he think in the 1940s? I knew that Roosevelt had signed Executive Order 9066, but uh, to find out that he had this background of prejudice against Japanese Americans uh, rather surprised me. And then as I did more research, I discovered that uh, there had been nobody who had really written about that. And so in discussing it with my mother, once she retired, she became my editor and later my professional collaborator. Yeah, I mean, I think I think one of the first your first book that I read was by order of the president. And I think you do make this really significant intervention in sort of understanding what, you know, trying to analyze sort of Roosevelt's role in in shaping EO 9066 and sort of his his position there. You know, I'm curious, like your mom sort of provided the introduction, but what got you hooked? You, you're such a prolific scholar of Japanese American history. Um, and I'm just curious, like what has kept you interested in this topic for so many years? Well, again, because I'm not Japan, not only am I not Japanese American myself, but I'm from New York and I live in Montreal. So I really didn't have a thought about the history of Japanese Americans and the history of Executive Order 9066 until I started working on Roosevelt. And as I kept finding things about prejudice and about uh, the state of Japanese Americans, because Roosevelt, you know, I was shocked, but I shouldn't have been. He was just representative of most Americans, probably of his class and time period. That, But coming from the East Coast, I never thought of prejudice against Asian Americans as being a racial matter. Of course, I knew there was discrimination against Asians. I, I lived quite near Chinatown, but I didn't think of it as a racial thing. I didn't feel like I was addressing a different race or something when I, when I met my Asian friends. But realizing that the, this, that from this research that Japanese Americans in particular and Asian Americans in general have been so influential in shaping America's life, its culture, its law, there, there seemed to be no end to what I could discover about it that would change my own view. Uh, and of course, I wanted to change other people's views to give us a richer understanding of our national history. Yeah, thank you. Um, in some of your more recent books, including your, your most recent book, you've been writing more about these unknown Nikkei. I'm curious, how do you find them? How do you pick who you're going to focus on? What are some resources that are useful in doing this kind of research um, and um, putting out these kinds of stories? Well, the resources, uh, in recent times, more and more, I've been using online resources. Of course, during COVID, when libraries were closed and I couldn't travel to even those that were open. I, I had to rely on what I already had in my files uh, from years of accumulated research, plus particularly the Japanese American press. Now we are spoiled, we historians in the last few years because Stanford University's uh, Hoover Institution has started the Japanese diaspora project and they have uh, put forward the Hoji Shimbun uh, directory, which is, uh, an enormous data, free database of Japanese American newspapers from the pre-war period, and which is keyword searchable. And also Densho's enormous resources, the uh, online uh, memorial uh, organization. Uh, I've been lucky enough to write for Densho's encyclopedia and be an assistant editor, and they have wonderful resources. And, and there are various others. So more and more I'm able to find uh, stories just by reading the newspapers. Uh, I made a joke uh, some time ago. Somebody asked me if I had seen something in the Rafu Shimpo newspaper recently. And I said, oh, I haven't read Rafu Shimpo since 1948. Yeah. And how do you like decide who your sort of unsung great Japanese Americans are going to be? Well, I have two sort of general rules. One is that they have to be dead. 
because it's much <laughs> easier to write about dead people. They, they never complain. Uh, yeah. Of course, when I first started writing my columns for the Nietzsche Bay, part of the reason that I was able to persuade uh, Kenji Tagoma, the editor of the Nietzsche Bay, to run my columns is that I said I could write about sensitive subjects because nobody was going to call up my mother to complain. Uh, my mother, <laughs> of course, been my professional collaborator. Uh, the other thing is that originally I gave it as a rule that anybody who was sufficiently known that they had an article about them in the Japanese American National Museum's encyclopedia that Brian Nia put together a long time ago uh, was too well known, unless I could find something that was unusual enough about them to talk about. Uh, for example, the, uh, many people had heard of the uh, linguist and senator Esai Hayakawa, uh, but nobody very much knew that he had written for a black newspaper during World War II or that he'd been a best-selling author. So I could find unusual sides of people Mostly, it's not a problem finding people to write about. The problem is figuring out which people I want to do first. Mm -hmm. Because when you scratch the surface of Japanese American history, you find that it's so different than you expected. In, in some sense, my work is subversive. That is, I try to go against the standard narrative of Japanese Americans being fishermen and farmers on the West Coast, going through camp, uh, not being politically active, uh, whereas it's much more fun to discover all of these extraordinary stories of mixed race Japanese Americans, artists, actors, performers, uh, musicians, gay and lesbian Japanese Americans, uh, political activists. So when you look at these misfits, as Mine Akubo used uh, to describe herself, you discover that the overall history changes because, in fact, for example, uh, people think that mixed race Japanese Americans were rather rare until, you know, two generations ago, one generation ago, uh, people who were your age and such. But in fact, there were hundreds of Japanese immigrants who uh, had partners who were non-Japanese. It was too expensive to, you know, bring women in from Japan and too restrictive and People, particularly outside the West Coast, did not have laws against interracial marriage stopping them. So all sorts of uh, mixed race children were born. And because they had these connections to non-Japanese communities and because of their own unique experience, they tended to bond and form coalitions and form interests outside of the Japanese American community. So they were some of the first businessmen, writers, uh, performers in the, among Japanese Americans. Yeah, I think you're, I think sort of you're sort of getting towards this question I'm going to ask. I'm curious, as, as we're thinking about this, about this um, at JANM and, at JANM and, and, and revising it, you know, I think there's this tension, or I'm feeling a tension, between um, trying to tell a story that encompasses as many Japanese Americans as possible and um, looking at these people who you would describe as the unsung great, people who maybe don't fit the mold. Um, and I'm curious either, you know, in your own work, how do you try to balance that? those two? Do you feel like there's just too much that's already been written about that sort of um, neat sort of narrative arc of Japanese American history? And then also I'm sort of curious, what's sort of your case for what these unsung great can maybe teach us about Japanese American history more broadly? That's, that's a great double question, which uh, I could probably spend an entire book answering. I guess I do think to a certain degree that the standard narrative has been written. Uh, of course, uh, I've added my part in talking about Roosevelt and such, and I think that it's all correct as far as it goes, but it leaves out so much. I mean, there's, for example, so much interaction historically between Japanese Americans and Black Americans. Black Americans are a community that showed Japanese how to be a minority in America, how to be a non-white group and yet build community institutions, uh, both religious and political, uh, and um, I'll try it, I'm losing my English, and uh, mutual, mutual aid. And also how to maintain a community presence uh, in protesting racism. And there have been all sorts of individuals, uh, Brian Nia and I, uh, 
did a, a series which I thought was fantastic on African American characters throughout the history of Japanese American fiction. Literally, the very first uh, uh, words were spoken by any character in Japanese American fiction in the sense that the very first published novel by a Japanese American, Carl S. Nakagawa's The Rendezvous of Mysteries in 1928, opens with an African American character. And the very first uh, memoir by a Japanese American, Kathleen Tamagawa's 1932 Holy Prayers on a Horse's Ear, uh, has African American characters who, who talk about the, the state of, of Kathleen Tamagawa as a mixed race person. So I think that it's we can let ourselves sort of tip off to the side and look at some of the exceptional cases. You know, I have an old friend who said that she loves reading my columns because it makes her realize that there was a life outside of what she experienced on the West Coast, that there were Japanese American communities and individuals with careers and possibilities beyond what she had. I think that it's very useful for us now if we're trying to imagine Japanese Americans within the mainstream, both being able to keep their connections to communities, but also, you know, being citizens in the larger in the larger community, uh, and in places outside of the West Coast, in Chicago, in New York, in New Orleans, which I've been doing a lot of research on in recent years, uh, in Cleveland, in Nebraska, in Texas. There are Japanese American communities all over this country. Uh, well, that country, because I'm in Montreal right now. Uh, and there are Japanese Canadian communities here uh, that have also some things to teach us. I think that the lesson is this diversity and that all of these things that we progressive action, um, integration of gay and lesbian communities have a past. There have always been gays and lesbians within Japanese American communities. There have always been mixed race people within Japanese American communities. There have always been feminists, uh, women uh, with an enormous amount of higher education within Japanese American communities. The Issei generation, the women were disproportionately educated compared to white women of their time as very important results for their kids, the Nisei generation and their grandkids, the Sansei generation because we know that the largest variable in educational success of children is the educational level of their parents. But I don't want to erase, you know, the large scale history of the Japanese American group. Um, there's, I do a lot of work about, you know, uh, what we would think of as ordinary people, that they, that they are somehow not so ordinary in, in various ways. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, I have been you. told that um, your you uh, favorite uh, Japanese American teacher is the very And I'm wondering if you can talk about him. And I'm wondering if you can talk about him. So maybe a little partial for Vince. But I'm wondering if maybe you could talk about Shinkichi and some of his brothers and sort of the ways that either they represent um, this broader Japanese American story or some of the exceptions that you were talking about. I think that the Tajiri family both is representative and exceptional. It's representative certainly in that uh, it was a large family of an, an Issei immigrant, a man uh, who worked as a bicycle repairman basically, and then a journalist and uh, head of an agricultural co-op. They grew up in uh, Los Angeles in a, in a mixed neighborhood uh, with blacks and with Latinos and others. and. Larry, uh, the eldest child, went to Catholic school. Uh, his name was Taniyoshi at birth, but he got the name Lauren Stephen after two saints because he went to Catholic school. And his brother, Vince, uh, and his sister, Yoshiko, both went into journalism. Vince, first as a writer, a sports writer and a, and a storyteller, and later as a photographer. He was the original photo editor for Playboy magazine, for example. Uh, and Yoshiko, uh, went to camp and then went to the Pacific with her husband and became the editor of the Tokyo edition of Stars and Stripes magazine. So Shinkichi, uh, who was born uh, George, uh, was the fourth child. He 
grew up in uh, San Diego. By the, the family had moved to San Diego in the 30s, and Mr. Tajiri died. And so the family went through some very difficult times. And he literally uh, had his 18th birthday on the day of Pearl Harbor. So, uh, but he developed as a sculptor and as an artist and went to camp and uh, studied with Isamu Noguchi, who was a friend of his brother, Larry, and studied with uh, non-Japanese sculptors and then went into the 442nd. He said, he told me later that he went to get out of the goddamn camp. Uh, he wasn't, it wasn't a, an ultra patriotic move, and, but he was quickly wounded but he went back to Chicago and, and started an artist collective called the Gaka Guild, which uh, needs a lot more study. I probably should do an article or two on them. But he was so tired of racism in the United States and the attacks on his own ability as an artist that he moved and went to Paris to study on the GI Bill art in Paris. He won one of the very first uh, prizes as a filmmaker at the Cannes Film Festival. And then he uh, met uh, a Dutch woman and moved to the Netherlands and became a national hero in the Netherlands doing these sculptures of Ronin uh, and uh, anti-war sculptures of uh, Japanese you know, uh, samurai and photographing the Berlin Wall. Uh, I mean, people who go to the Japanese American National Museum will see his friendship knot uh, in Ellison Onizuka Square but he has sculptures all over the Netherlands and he's just a, a remarkable, he was just a remarkable sculptor and printer and illustrator and photographer and uh, a very inspiring figure for generations of artists. But when I went Thank to you. visit him in 2006, I expected him to be this sort of austere figure uh, you know, I, I went expecting, you know, Picasso, and I wound up with Pat Morita. That is, he had a <laughs> wicked humor and uh, sometimes body. Yeah, I've also heard that he has repaired, or he, before he passed away, repaired a castle. Um, and I think he's knighted in the UK, right? Um, so many. He did live in a castle for the last uh, uh several decades of his life. I stayed in the sort of the, the guest quarters of the castle. It's a, it was quite a, it's quite a beautiful building. And he gave rise to generations of further artists. His two daughters, Jata and Ryu, uh, both became artists. I know that my friend and collaborator, Jonathan Van Harmelen, uh, did a wonderful interview of Jata for Discover Nikkei. And he's also, Jonathan has also written on um, Dutch uh, reactions to uh, Japanese American confinement and redress. And some of those were um, interviews with Shinkichi and there were drawings by Ryu and such. So the, because of the Jiri family, the Dutch people are far more aware of Japanese American history than they would be otherwise. Yeah, I was going to also mention, you know, the next generations of the Tajiri family are also fairly noteworthy in their own right. Um, so thanks for mentioning some of them. Um, I'll just plug again for the audience. If you have questions that you would like to ask, please put them in the chat on either Facebook or YouTube. Um, and I'll just maybe ask one more question before we go into the rapid fire question. Um, but if you, you know, who's the next person you're writing about? Who's the next unsung great that we'll get to learn about? I just did a piece on the Ichioka family that is not Yuji Ichioka, but a different Ichioka family, the family of Dr. Toshio Ichioka. He had uh, four daughters of whom three became Hollywood actresses, notably his eldest one who became a star under the name Toshio Mori. Meanwhile, Dr. Ichioka, uh, his second wife after his first wife died, who was a nurse originally from Hawaii, uh, Tsutsayo uh, Nokai became a doctor herself. And so the two of them had a clinic in Boyle Heights serving not only Japanese Americans, but uh, Latino Americans and African Americans as well. And so that's a, what I thought was a very interesting uh, study. And then Miki Morita, uh, another Japanese American actor of the 1930s, who went on a campaign against stereotyping of Japanese 
when he was offered a, a, an evil Japanese spy part in a film and he not only turned it down, he went to the consulates of Japan and the United States and made an, literally an international incident of it and uh, with, with great courage. So there are, there are some interesting stories coming for Discover Nikkei. And meanwhile, I'm uh, working on a long history of the transnational contacts between Japan and Louisiana and the long history of Japanese Americans in New Orleans, which is a yet, yet another story, but uh, too, too long for giving you now. Yeah, well, I'm looking forward to reading about that. Um, so we'll move into the rapid fire questions. Um, so the first one is, who is your Nikkei hero? Oh, I have several, but I think that Aiko Hertzig Yoshinaga is a great example of an Issei hero. She is a woman who had, you know, not higher education. She had been a secretary for many years. And then after she, she retired, she spent every day, weekday, going to the National Archives and cataloging, looking for, discovering documents to help make the case of the injustice of Executive Order 9066. And with help from her husband, Jack Herzig, she found, uh, along with Peter Irons, the smoking guns uh, that helped lead to redress. But she was such a completely unassuming person. And when, when I was asked to, uh, from my memory of her, I remembered her extraordinary modesty. She would tell me, you know, uh, Greg, I have so much to learn from you, which would leave me, you know, stammering, you've forgotten more than I'll ever know. Yeah. She also, right, a fashion designer early on in her career. So it seems like someone who had a very interesting life. Right. I, I think Michi Weglin had a career as a fashion designer. Oh, uh, Michi also, again, came in as an amateur and historian yeah. and, and found new stuff. The, the two of them were great friends and collaborators. Yes, thank you. So the next rapid question is, what's your favorite Japanese food? Uh, I love sushi and sashimi. I love tempura, which I've been eating since I was a little boy. I love futamaki. I grew up in uh, my first years in the Bronx, and we had this family of Saudi men who were my best friends, and they would make futamaki for us and give us botan candy, and my parents would give them you know, apple pie or whatever. Uh, I also happen to love uni. Uh, my, my mother used to love uni hand rolls, and through her, I became... Be, became a lover of, of uni. And so my great orgasmic delight was to go to Hokkaido, uh, where I could get an enormous bowl of uni. Yeah, I have to say, I don't really like uni that much, um, but more for you. Um, so the next rapid fire question is, what is the Japanese value that has most influenced you? The Japanese value. Now, I have to say that I don't know that much about Japan. Uh, I study Japanese Americans, and just as an African American historian might not might or might not know anything about Africa, and uh, I recognize the Japanese roots of Japanese American life, but I also believe that Japanese Americans are quite a unique community. Uh, I have often told my Japanese American friends when we tour Japanese cultural centers and see little kids playing, you know, taiko or learning martial arts or learning Japanese language, that I think it's great for them to uh, reunite with their Japanese heritage, but there's also a Japanese American heritage that, and they should learn bowling or basketball, uh, which are great Japanese American sports. So the Japanese value, I think that I uh, appreciate the most is gambate, the silent struggle, uh, not to give up, not to uh, let yourself be discouraged, even if the route is a long one. Thank you. And the last one is, what do you like most about Discover Nikkei? I think what I like most about Discover Nikkei, other than the fact that they give me a forum to, uh, to write, and they're very good about, you know, Discover Nikkei, it's very, they're very good about being tolerant of my writing about all sorts of things, uh, whether it's, you know, uh, Japanese Americans, Japanese Canadians, Japanese from France, I think that it's wonderful that their focus is international and intergroup. Uh, we, I, with my buddy Seth Jakobowitz, I did an, a set of articles on the painter uh, Leonard Fujita, 
uh, Fuji Tatsugaharu and his uh, travels around the Americas. And the Discover Nikkei people were able to translate those and put them out in Spanish and Portuguese and Japanese. This kind of multilingual and international audience really uh, is good because people tend otherwise to focus too much on the continental United States. And there are so many similarities and interesting differences between Japanese in the United States, in Canada, in Latin America, in Hawaii, that uh, the, the larger focus of Discover Nikkei is really gratifying for them. Yeah, I think that's something I like about Discover Nikkei and you're, you know, I think you do a good job of covering um, at least North America, Nikkei North America. Um, so I'll just open it up one more time to see if there are any questions from the audience. Um, and if there aren't, there's a really prolific body of work on Discover Nikkei where you can read about a lot of the people that Greg has profiled previously. Maybe while I'll, I'll give it one more minute, but um, I'll just ask what might be a final question. Um, one of my favorite, it's not on Discover Nikkei, but one of my um, personal favorite articles of yours, um, we also share an alma mater in the University of Pennsylvania. Um, and you wrote about an article for the Penn Gazette about um, their World War II uh, policies around Japanese American students and Naomi Nakano um, and sort of this weird policy where they would continue to let her be enrolled, but would not admit new students, so she couldn't continue on as a graduate student. Um, and I'm wondering if maybe you could talk a little bit more about her or um, the history of sort of college going and, and some of the college um, bans of Japanese Americans. Well, the case you're talking about is, yes, my, my alma mater is University of Pennsylvania. And when the Association for Asian American Studies had its conference in 1999, I snuck off to Penn's archives to do research. It was actually my very first article on Asian American history. It was on the exclusion of uh, Japanese American students at Penn during World War II. Uh, they made a secret uh, deal with naval intelligence that they uh, reported on all of their Japanese and Japanese American students even before Pearl Harbor. They were already investigating them, even in time of peace. And then after Pearl Harbor, they made this secret policy decision that they would not let in any more Japanese Americans, similar to what happened at Indiana University that Eric Langowski blew the whistle on, uh, found and, but the, at the case of Penn, uh, they hid it and, but they got caught because they excluded a student who was so impossibly perfect that it's almost like dramatic irony. You know, she was the daughter of a Penn alum who, even though he was a Japanese immigrant and an enemy alien, was such a prestigious architect that he was working uh, for the government, building quartermaster depots during the war. She herself was a straight A student and a student government president and uh, a scholarship student. And so she applied to go on to graduate school and they excluded her for, for no reason and were not able to give a reason. And an activist student, again, blew the whistle on them and so they were eventually forced to uh, admit her, by which time she had already uh, promised to go to Bryn Mawr, her mother's alma mater, but, or, or her mother's uh, parallel alma mater, her mother had been a Tsuda student. But then she then went, and the rest of her family went to Penn in, in later years. She then became uh, a leader of the JACL in St. Louis, uh, and she married Joseph Tanaka, who is the brother of Chester Tanaka, who wrote the book on the 442nd. So uh, the family continued to be donors to Penn and, to, and three generations of Nakano students, uh, went, family students went to Penn. So I think it's a, a great story of Japanese Americans, again, that shows that there are people who are architects and writers and people outside of the West Coast who nonetheless did face prejudice did face uh, discrimination, although Naomi Nakano herself said that she felt more discrimination as a woman at Penn than as a Japanese American. Uh, but I think it's uh, an emblematic, indeed an emblematic story of Japanese Americans, even or especially outside of the West Coast. Yeah, thank you so much. Yeah, thank we'll you so much. We'll post questions in the audience.
for the audience. If you could share more about uh, the Japanese French connections that you've written about in some of your articles. Well, the Japanese were in Paris. Uh, they were fascinated with French culture. There were all of there were a number of uh, Japanese artists who studied in France and produced it in France. And of course, Fujita is is probably along with Seshu Hayakawa and the Emperor of Japan, the most famous Japanese of of his time period. And there even was a niece. The first Nisei writer was a French woman, Kiko Yamata who was born in 1897 of a Japanese diplomat father and a French mother in Lyon. And she wrote a novel about geisha called Masako in 1925. It's the very first novel by Anise, as far as I'm aware, anywhere in the world. And so I'm happy to continue to write about the Japanese Americans who went to study in France, whether it's the artist Henry Sugimoto or Shinkichi Tajiri or the opera singer uh, Agnes Miyakawa became a star at the Paris Opera singing Madame Butterfly. And uh, there were other opera singers who performed in France. Again, um, there's so much connection between the artists of Japanese ancestry in Japan, in Europe, and in the United States, particularly in the places like New York. Uh, Seshu Hayakawa, for example, left Hollywood during the, the sound era lived in New York for several years and then moved to Paris where he became an actor there. And he was in Paris during World War II and then came back to Hollywood after. So I think that these are connections that people don't tend to make spontaneously, but in fact, there is a good deal of contact and interaction among people in these different spaces uh, in artistic, literary, and activist circles. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. you so much for your time, for your really thoughtful responses, and just for, you know, all of the writing you've done. And I'm really looking forward to the piece on New Orleans. Um, so I just want to plug a few of the upcoming Discover Nikkei programs that are coming up. The next NEMA Voices episode is going to be on October 25th with author Gil Asakawa and guest host Nancy Matsumoto. Gil is a frequent contributor to Discover Nikkei and his latest book, Tabemasho, Let's Eat, A Tasty History of Japanese Food in America is due out later this summer. Gil is also part of Discover Nikkei's editorial committee for Itadakimasu 3 Nikkei Food, Family, and Community series. If you're interested in reading these Nikkei food stories, you can check them out. Um, the stories are being submitted from all around the world, and you have the chance to vote on your favorites. Um, and... Also, uh, Discover Nikkei is planning some future programs, including the D Nikkei Uncovered Poetry Reading in September and a multilingual program about Nikkei food in December, which will be a follow-up to the program earlier this year. You can check out discovernikkei.org for details in the coming months. Finally, Discover Nikkei would love to hear from you. You can contact them at editor at discovernikkei.org with your feedback and suggestions for future episodes and programs. So thanks again to Greg Robinson for joining us, to the amazing Discover Nikkei team working behind the scenes on this event, and to all of you who tuned in to watch. Good night. Thank you for everybody who stayed in.